from China thousands of years ago, so it's a very ancient writing system. Now, I want to introduce you to a couple of these kanji today. Do we have that uh, slideshow? Because God has done something cool in this alphabet. Okay, do you see this symbol up here? This is the Japanese word for create. Now, what does it look like? Just a bunch of like crisscrossy lines, right? But but this is actually put together um, with uh, several different parts to it. So let's break it apart and see what it actually means. Uh, the first part, can we get the next slide? This part means dust. The next part is breath. The next one is alive. And the last part means to walk because God 
formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living being. The word for create in the Japanese language comes straight out of Genesis. Now let me show you another one. Okay, this one is the, the word for desire or covet. And it's made up of two parts. The first part is the symbol for woman. And the second part is a symbol for two trees. Does that sound familiar? What did the first woman covet or desire but the trees in the middle of the Garden of Eden? Again, it's right from the biblical story. I want to share one more with you. This is the symbol for righteousness. Now, how do you make a symbol that means righteousness? Well, they put together these symbols. The first one is a symbol for a human hand. The next one is a spear. And the last one is a symbol for lamb. Because how do we gain our righteousness but by slaying the perfect lamb? You see, God embedded his gospel message right into the very heart of Japanese culture, into their own ancient language, something that is uniquely Japanese. And why did he do that? Because Japan belongs to our God. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is for the Japanese people. Too long has this country been in spiritual darkness. Too long has the word of God been silenced in Japan. It is time for the word of God to be spoken in Japanese to the Japanese people and for the light of his salvation to shine in that darkness. And that is what we are going to Japan to do. Whew, I'd like to follow that. <laughs> Goodness. Oh, well, thank you so much for having us today, guys. Um, Thank you so much to, to your pastor and for Pastor Dave and, and for Stevie for inviting us. It really it really means a lot for us to, to get invited like this. You know, we're we're just like you said, we're we're in Allendale, so I just go right on 30 for about an hour and a half, you'll hit Allendale and I like coming to churches like this because it's uh I do I sometimes speak at big churches and you've gotta be very impressive and you gotta have a lot, but I like coming to a, a small town because uh you know you gotta impress some churches, you come to a Small time, just start talking about Jesus and people get excited. You give me an amen whenever we say the name of Jesus. So, yeah, I like being here. It's this idea. So, it's so good. So, I would like to start today with uh, an experiment. Has, uh, has anyone here ever traveled, like been on a mission trip, like national, international? Has anyone ever, like, traveled to a location for the purpose of sharing the gospel? Can, can I get some hands? Or even go ahead and stand for me today if you've done that. You know, national, and I should just, yep. Are we good? All right. Okay. Okay, are you we going to keep hands? Okay, oh, do hands then. We'll stick with hands. Okay, so, okay, keep your hand up if you've done that, all right? Okay, keep your hand up if when you were going to that location, you were kind of nervous. You were like, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I have anything to offer. Keep your hand up if that's you. Okay, so that's pretty much everybody. All right, keep your hand up if you were like amazed by what God did with your ministry when you were out there. Okay, so that's everybody. That's a, Okay, so why is that important? Because here's what, what I want to show you today, guys. Um, what this tells me is the nations and people are starving for the gospel. That it's not about us. It's not about the, the, the credibility that we bring. It's not about um, our own abilities. It's just the fact that people are hungry to know about the salvation of Jesus Christ. They are hungry for like to know, they're starving to know for the blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. They are starving to know that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and starving to know that you are precious to our God. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm here today because many years ago, a missionary left Kentucky, left his job um, as a stockbroker on Wall Street and then opened up a little cafe in Galway, Ireland and just had all these Irish people walking in and stopped me one day and just told me, you are precious to our God. And that changed my life. And, and, and this is what happens all, all around the world. You are here today. You are in this church today because someone wanted you to know that you are precious to our God. And we're, um, we're the assembly of God. And that is so great. And, and what's so amazing about the assembly of God, and I don't know if you know this, we, we started in the USA. And we have about three and a half million adherents in the USA. But we have 70 
Uh, but no, I gotta get that. Yes, 70 million people all around the world who are adherents to the assemblies of God. That means like for every American, what's that, like 20 plus times we, we, we send out missionaries to grow and grow and grow. Why do we do that? No other denomination does that. Because we want the nations to know you are precious to our God. And we're going to Osaka, Japan, because we want that, that city to know you are precious to our God. There was a, a recent survey done, and it, it asked people, you know, after like this whole COVID crazy, uh, what is the thing you are most looking forward to coming back to once like the restrictions are over? Can anyone tell me what it was? Take a guess what they think people said uh, more they were looking forward to more than anything else coming back to. <laughs> wow. Whose kid is that? <laughs> Movies. All right, there's a guess. Any other, any other guesses? What was that? Traveling. Traveling. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Anyone else got it? Church. Church. Ding, ding, ding. You got it, brother. More than any other thing, more than movies and traveling and going bowling and going to restaurants, people said the thing they wanted more than anything else was to get back to church. This wasn't a Christian survey. This was a national survey. It was a hunger to be back with the saints, to be getting right into the Word, to be worshiping in community, to be loving one another and feeding one another and just feasting on the goodness of our God. And I think, you know, I think God is going to use all of this stuff to do something amazing for His glory. I think God, this was, this COVID was, was a God opportunity to do something amazing. And I believe through this, God, like, He gave us just a little bit of hunger so that we could appreciate just almost like a sliver of what it was like or what it is like for the people in the nations who have no Bible, who have no church, who have no word, who have no hope, who never get to hear Jesus Christ has died for your sins, who never get to hear you are radically, unstoppably, and unconditionally loved by our God. There's a hunger, a hunger, I think in the nations right now, a hunger for whatever it is. Our, our missions director, Greg Munda, said recently, is it fair that some hear the saving message of Jesus Christ again and again and again when others have not even heard it once? You know, and this is just all I want to say today, is the gospel of Jesus Christ is so precious. People are so, so hungry for the good news of Jesus Christ. And I think sometimes we, we forget how precious it is. We forget how good it is, how blessed we are like to have this church and, and to have Bibles and to have the Word and just to have so much freedom to just like live where we live. It is so precious. It's so good. You know, and it was interesting because even in Jesus' day, like people didn't get how precious it was to like have the Word of God in their presence. You know, like Jesus would go out and preach and he'd be like, you know, talking about salvation and, and like just the goodness of God. People would just ask like, you know, like, why are we supposed to do this on the Sabbath? And why, why is he doing it like that? Because we were talking about it. And just getting into dumb, you know, read the New Testament. They get into like these dumb arguments. So Jesus is like, I want you to get how precious this is. I want you to know for like a minute what it's like for someone who doesn't have the goodness that you have. So Jesus did what many pastors have done is Jesus takes a short term mission trips. So he like gets all his disciples together and said, we're going to go on a mission trip, guys. So we like, you know, get some matching t-shirts and some like, you know, anti-diarrhea medication and some VBS toys. And it's like, all right, guys, let's hit, let's go on this mission trip. So if you got your Bibles this morning, open them up to uh, Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. Matthew chapter 15. We're going to start in verse 21. This is a story about Jesus and the disciples going on a mission trip. So, uh, you know, this is the only time in the ministry of Jesus where he leaves Israel. All the other times he stays in Israel, he stays at home, uh, just brings the word uh, to the Israelites. But um, this is the only time. So let's just uh, start. We'll start in verse 21. So it says, leaving that place. Leaving that place. Uh, leaving Israel, leaving comfort, leaving where you know everybody, leaving your culture. Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, a little geography lesson for you here. Um, Tyre and Sidon is just right north of, uh, of Israel. 
So he, we, we, so he was like, uh, from where we saw in like the last chapter, he's about like, goes about 20 miles north. And um, this is the first time, like I said, that they leave their mission trip. So they leave, this is actually uh, the Phoenician homeworld. So they basically go to like uh, the center of the Phoenician empire, right into the jaws of like these pagan Phoenicians. And what happens? So he steps across the border. As soon as he steps across the border, what happens? Uh, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and is suffering terribly. So as soon as he gets across the border, someone runs right up to him and said, and she's like, I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. Now there's two groups here, okay? Two groups I want you to pay attention to. First group you've got is uh, the Canaanite woman. And the next group you've got is the disciples. And Jesus is kind of almost really working on the disciples here more than the Canaanite woman. So you've got one group. You've got the Canaanite woman. She's starving. Not for food, but for spiritual sustenance. She has no Bible. She has no temple. She has no church. She has no word. She has no spirit. She has no presence of Jesus. She has nothing. She is spiritually starving. And then you go on the next side, you've got the 12 apostles. These dudes have abundance. They are full up. They are Jews. They got the Old Testament. They got the prophets. They got the spirit. They got the temple. They got the priests. And they spend every single day in the presence of Jesus Christ. But the Jews were supposed to take the abundance God had given them and bring it to the other nations who were starving. But they didn't do it. They didn't do it. They kept to themselves. In fact, most of what they did, they didn't go out and preach to the other nations. They stayed in their own nation and they would say, can you believe how disgusting they are to the other nations? It is so fun. Do you know the sins they commit? Oh, they have idols and they do this disgraceful thing. And I wouldn't even repeat in good company what my uncle told me when he went over there one time. Oh, would turn your skin. It was horrible. So this is most of what they do is they spend more time complaining than transforming. They spend more time giving out about the state of the world than bringing the good news and transforming the world like we as Christians have been called to do. God had given them everything they could possibly want and need. The word, the prophets, the preachers, the temples, the heroes of the faith and the presence. Yet these 12 dudes did not see how precious this gospel was. So Jesus takes them on a mission trip. All right, guys, tire inside. Let's go. We're going to do this. And um, he does it so they could see how good they have it. Now, I don't know if as a parent you've ever done this. But has any parents here ever had a fantasy about shipping your child to Africa? <laughs> All right, yeah, oh yeah, we got some. We got two honest parents. I know you all have done this, okay. Like when your kid is just being like a little ungrateful, spoiled, stubborn little... I, I want to ship you so bad to a little village in Botswana. And I want you to go there, and if you want to complain about my food, go talk to a little boy who has no food. Don't want to make your bed? Go talk to a boy who doesn't have a bed. You're like, I'm going to get 90 minutes of video games. Go to a place where they've never seen video games, and you come back here and tell me how hard you have it. Parents, have you ever had the Africa fantasy? <laughs> oh, yeah. Amen. Amen. And, and it's basically to say, kid... Uh, there are billions of people that would take on your problems right now. I want you to see how good you have it. The disciples did not know how good they had it. So Jesus said, I want you to go to a place that has spiritual starvation. And as soon as so they go there, and as soon as they go right into the pagan stronghold of the Phoenician Empire, surrounded by nasty idols, surrounded by uh, all of the sin that went with it, and, and what they didn't have, and as soon as they step across the border, they are starving. And a woman runs up to them and says, Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed. She is suffering terribly. I'm starving. 
I'm starving for you, Jesus. I need you. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. I'm broken. I'm a sinner. I am star. I know nothing about the world or about the word of God, but I know that my, my, my country is broken. My family is broken. I am broken, and I need you, Jesus. But look at what Jesus does. Verse 23. Jesus didn't answer a word. And this, I, I just, this just breaks me. Jesus doesn't answer a word. And I'm like, come on, Jesus, say something cool. Do like a Jesus-y thing here that you're so good at. Give this amazing word. But he doesn't say a word. Why, Jesus? Why are you silent? Because sometimes the church is silent. Sometimes we're supposed to be the one to say something and we don't say anything. Sometimes we're supposed to be the one to change that nation, but we don't do it. And instead of being... Uh, uh, we are, instead of like preaching and, and declaring that word, we just spend time complaining, like what the disciples do. So the disciples came to him and urged him, oh, send her away, Jesus, for she keeps crying out to us. I love what the disciples say here. She keeps crying out for us. And you're like, dude, she wasn't crying out for you at all. She was crying out for Jesus. She didn't want some old second-rate apostle here. They, she wants Jesus. She wants the main source. Get out the way, apostle. Um... But Jesus is silent. And Jesus is treating this woman in a way that the disciples wanted to treat her. They don't address her. Sometimes treating her the way that the church has treated people. Now, I, I, this probably isn't you, but I know I've spent a lot of time in my life being like complaining about the world as opposed to transforming the world. I've like complained that people didn't know what I was supposed to tell them. I was a teacher in inner city St. Paul, and I worked with kids that didn't really function well in the public school system, had a lot of problems. And um, one day I was like, I was working with this one kid, and uh, yeah, he was just getting in a lot of trouble. His family was about to get evicted, the food was a real problem, and you know, there was no steady source of income coming in. And I was just, it was just a lot of problems I was trying to help him out on. Um, and, and knowing that his family was financially struggling, one day, he came into my class, and this little Canaanite had got the biggest, ugliest tattoo on his forearm. Now, I'm not against tattoos, but I'm really against a tattoo when your family's about to get evicted. So I was, oh, I was about to go Old Testament on this kid. I was so angry. I was like, you stupid, what is wrong with you? Your family's starving, you're doing this, you get a stupid And the Holy Spirit said, you didn't, Patrick. You didn't. And that shut me right up. Here I am, as a teacher, yelling at a student for not knowing something, it was my responsibility to tell them. I was so in judgment mode that I had negated my responsibility to bring some good news to this kid. So I sat down with this kid. I said, come on, we're, we're, I took him out of class. I said, we're going to spend the next couple hours, and I'm going to show you how to do a budget. And we sat down, and we talked about what they were bringing in, and talked about what their outgoings were. And I said, come on, you've got it. You've got to bring, put out less than you're uh, bringing in. He said, whoa, I've never done this before. I said, yeah, it's really easy. We'll just do it like this. And we sat down. And then he was like, this is so good. I've got to go home and show this to my mom, and I've got to show this to my uncles, because we've never seen this before. And just that little bit of knowledge, that little bit of crumb that I was so willing to judge him for not having was the little bit of info that he needed to transform his life and his world. You know, sometimes I think we become silent when we stop believing how precious the gospel is. When we stop seeing how powerful it is, how people are hungry for this gospel. When we stop believing that the world is hungry for your testimony. When we, when we sometimes start believing that we're going to overcome by like, you know, the word of our complaints and our frustration with society. Instead of saying that we're going to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That's what's going to happen. That's what the world needs to hear. As Christians, we are called to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Do you know what salt did? 
In the ancient world, you, it was used to preserve and to cleanse your food. To preserve and to cleanse. As Christians, we are called to preserve and to cleanse this world. But I've been in places in my life where all I've done as a Christian is complain about the state of the world. I've realized I'm, 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 like, I'm like a refrigerator that doesn't cool your food, but just comes with a warning to let you know how bad the food looks, you know? Your bacon is rotting, your bacon is rotting, your bacon is rotting. Useless. Useless. If your salt has lost its saltiness, throw it out. And I've lost my saltiness sometimes because I've stopped believing that people are hungry for this good news. But if we keep looking here, verse 24, he, um, he answered, Jesus finally answers. He said, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. But the woman came, and I love this, Jesus keeps walking, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. But it says, she knelt before him, she got in his way and said, no, Lord, help me, help me, Lord, help me. We are going to sort this out right now. Now, then, in his, and while she's in his way, she's just saying, I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. He says this. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Now, that's a hard word. Now, can you imagine if the preacher ever spoke to you like that? If that ever happened, I'd be like, well, did you speak? To, oh, I am so offended. I am done with this church. I'm done with this preacher. I can't believe you spoke to me like that. Well, I'm never coming back here, and I'm just going to keep going. And, and I've thought about this. Why is this woman not offended? Why is she like, well, I'm never, never, never going to Christianity again, never going to church again. Why is she not offended? And I've realized this. You can only afford to be offended when you live in abundance. Check that. You can only afford to be offended when you live in abundance. I tell you, brothers and sisters, I have worked in a whole lot of jobs where I have so wanted to tell my boss, oh, exactly what I thought of him and his stupid company and where this job could... Oh, I won't go on. I'll speak churchy today. <laughs> Got a couple of it. But I didn't do it because I needed the job. Y'all ever been there? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing. Uh, but if you, I would like, if you got a better job, you know, less work, and let, you would tell that boss what, because you can afford to be offended when you have abundance. In America, we can be a very offended people sometimes, right? Because we have a whole lot of abundance. You know, and there's so many churches in Minnesota that we sometimes feel, oh, well, I don't like this church. I'll just go to the church down the street. See how you like that. You know, and we can get so, like, caught up in, in this whole thing. Churches can be like restaurants. You know, you don't like one, you go to another. So much variety. And, 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 and because of that, sometimes we don't see how precious the gospel is because it's abundant. Sometimes when something is abundant, we feel like it's not precious. Something can only be precious when there isn't much of it. That's why, you ever seen like people go to fancy restaurants and they eat oysters? And they're paying like $15 and go, oh, this oyster's so good. And oh, it's worth every penny. It's like, and they somehow forget that they're sucking cold, salty snot out of a dirty rock and paying 15 <laughs> bucks for it. Because they've made the mistake that because it is rare, it must be precious. Give me some chicken and mashed potatoes right now. Okay, I don't care how common it is, it's good. It's better, right there. <laughs> you see, we, just because it is, um, the, mo the gospel is precious. It is so precious, even though it feels like it's common in Minnesota. Do you know Crossroads Church is precious? You know, I want you, this is, take anything else from what I say today. There are people right now in this community that are starving to be in this building. Amen. That that are, I'm telling you, brother, sis, I know this. They are weeping right now, and they needed to be in the presence of the Lord worshiping with us today. They are hungry for this precious, beautiful spirit that resides in this church. And they're counting on you to share your testimony of what God has done for you. They need that. That is the thing that they need. You know, this Phoenician woman could have looked at Jesus and said, I, I am so offended. You call me a dog. I will never be spoken to like that again. But you know what? 
if I leave, where else am I going to go? Because I don't have another option right now. I'm desperate. I've tried other things. I've, I've tried fooling around and, and all kinds of stupid things and, and gone to all uh, pagan nonsense, but, but I never got my miracle. And you, Jesus... You are the one name under heaven by which man must be saved. You, by your name alone do the demons run away in fear. I might not like everything you have to say. I might get offended at the church. I might really like oysters. But you know what, Jesus? I still need you. And you are precious to me. And there is nowhere else I can get redemption and eternal life. Where else can I go for the Spirit of God? And she replies in verse 27... Yes, it is, Lord, she said. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Glory. 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 She's saying, Jesus, I've been everywhere. I've worshipped every pagan god on the circuit. I have been, I have feasted at the pagan table. I've tried getting rich and I didn't get my miracle. I tried being popular. I didn't get my miracle. I tried cutting the chicken's head off for an idol. I didn't get my miracle. You know what, Jesus? I don't care what you call me. I don't care that um, you can go ahead and bless these 12 disciples. Give them all the Bible. Give them all the church. Give them all the spirit. Give them the good preacher. You, I don't even need a perfect church, Lord Jesus. But if I could get a crumb, if I could just get a little tiny bit of you, Jesus, I know I get my miracle. I know I would get my miracle. I know I'm a dog. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm ignorant. I know I'm a woman, but I got a devil to fight, and I would sooner fight like a starving dog than a chubby little spoiled child. I need to the presence of God right now. You won't stop me. I'm kneeling down. I'm in your way. I'm going to keep worshiping until you bless me, and I won't go until you bless me. I need my crumb because I hunger for you, Jesus. Glory. 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 This is a hungry faith, and it's powerful. And Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. You have great faith. You get it. You get it. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. You get it. Canaanite woman, you are precious to our God. Precious to our God. You are healed by our God. People, uh, that you, you are going to receive the blessing of God because you get how precious this gospel is. You know, sometimes people ask me, they say, why is there abundant miracles all the time on the mission field, but we don't see them so much in America? And I think it's because there are nations where people hunger for the mere crumbs that fall from heaven's table. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever uh, done this, uh, moms, but have you ever like slaved away all day and like just worked in the kitchen and you have just cooked, or dads, you've cooked your kids the most nutritious, delicious, colorful, beautiful meal. All five, you know, food groups are there and it just looks amazing and you just can't wait to present it to your family. And then the kids look at it and go, I don't like it. I want mac and cheese. And you're like, you little snack. <sighs> Glory. You ever been there? But, but you know what's at your feet? There's a dog. The family dog is just looking up at you, and it's got big bright eyes, and its tongue is hanging out, and its tail is flapping, and it's like, oh, check me out. I'm being so good right now. I just, I love you so much. You are the best, and if you could give me, oh, just one little crumb of that food, one little bit, I'm going to love you forever. I'm going to think you're just the best person. I'm just going to just praise you for the rest of my life if I could just get a crumb. Jesus is like saying, oh man, I would sooner, I sooner the faith of the dog than the chubby spoiled child. I love for those who hunger and thirst for this righteousness. You know, and I sometimes go to churches, I, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, I want to speak something into your pastor's life. You know, a lot of pastors are struggling right now because they're getting a whole lot I don't think it's from this church. I've not heard it, but a lot of them are getting feedback from their congregation like, oh, well, you know, I'm not coming to your church if you're going to have us wear masks. So I'm not coming if you're open and open. I'm not. And they're getting just attacked and attacked and attacked. And people are just getting angry at the church. And I'm not being fed. And I just look at that and I think, man, maybe it's not that you're not being fed, but you've forgotten how precious a crumb can be. 
You've forgotten how good and precious this wonderful church is. Even if it's a tough time and we're all just figuring this out, there is something so precious in just a crumb. A dog can be more grateful for a crumb than a disciple can be at the seat of the table. I just want you, that's why it says in Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we get to that place of spiritual <clears throat> poverty, when we say, Jesus, I hunger for you and nothing else, we see God. We see God move. The faith is precious. This church is precious. There is eternal value in this place. There is a testimony in your heart that your neighbor is starving to hear. In the land that is spiritually dry, the fire of the Holy Spirit will burn brighter. Brothers and sisters, let me get on to why we're here. We're going to Japan. And as my wife said, um, it is... Uh, it is like no Christians. We're going to like one of the least Christian places on earth. Uh, we're going to Osaka. Population, uh, 40 million people. 40 million. And most of them have never heard the gospel. Just to put that, I think like the state of Minnesota has five. It says one little city has 40 million people. And we have no Assembly of God Church there at all. No missionary at all. We're going to be the first. And there's a hunger in that place. It's on the island of Honshu. Oh, you bingo guys right there. All right. <laughs> now, this population is larger than New York, L.A., London combined. And we figured out, and we did this with a friend of ours who is there right now, if every single church and missionary was going to reach every single person in Osaka, that each, each church would have to reach 650,000 people. 650. That's like one person reaching all the Twin Cities and beyond. One person. Brothers and sisters, we need to give them more because here's what's cool. Japan is hungry for the gospel. They are just so hungry for the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, we, we were there recently and it was just amazing uh, because they were just, they wanted to know more and more and more about the gospel. They just kept asking questions uh, and just little things. You know, about my son and I, we were hanging out with these students um, in, in like houses and dorms. And they would just keep asking more and more questions about God. You know, it was really funny. We were there at Christmas time. It was January. Just gone Christmas. And they were talking about Christmas and uh, what they did. And they, you know, it's weird. They have trees. They have presents. They have decorations. They don't have turkey, so they all get big buckets of KFC. That's their turkey. But they have no Jesus. Isn't that amazing? We were able to export the whole holiday without Jesus. And, and I, so I was asking them, they were talking about the presents they got and what they did. And I asked them, I said, what do you think, why do you think we celebrate Christmas? And uh, they all looked at each other, kind of like perplexed. And, uh, and one of them said, uh, oh, oh, Santa Claus's birthday. <laughs> nope, uh, it was Jesus' birthday. And they're like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. And one of them goes, how old is Jesus now? And I said, how old do you think he is? And they're like, oh, my goodness. Well, he's pretty old now, right? Because... Wasn't he around in World War II? And he, he lives in America, right? And uh, so, but what was so cool about that was we got to start at the beginning. The very beginning. And everything they learned was brand new. You know how many times we've heard a sermon and just briefly mentioned about the star that went over Bethlehem? They never heard it before. They never heard about the three wise men. And they never, they had, why did they bring these gifts? Oh, let me tell you, i got my sermon notes right here. And it just got to get better and better. And then we got to tell about the miracles of Jesus and how good he was and how he just loved everyone. And they would think, well, isn't that an American thing? No, Jesus was Asian, brother. He's closer to you than he is to, you know, whitey like me. And, uh, and they were, whoa, this is amazing. And then we got to tell them about eternal life. And one said, I never knew. I never my whole life heard there was something after I die. And then we got to tell them about the, how Jesus died and his blood was, was shed for their sins. And they were like so broken that he died. But you know what then we got to say? Three days later, he rose again. Lord, what? And they were, Hundledes, God. Is it true? Hundledes. It is the truth. It is the truth. Hundledes. Hundledes. And it was so good and so beautiful. And they just wanted to know more and more about Jesus. 
One, one young lady came up to me and said, I want to just feel Jesus in my heart. I want that uh, spiritual life. And, and she said, but I've prayed and I haven't felt anything. And I said, did you pray out loud? I said, no. I just go, I said, go pray out loud and just, just, just share it. Just speak to God with passion. So she went off. A few days later, came back and said, I got it. I got it. I felt the presence, the, the presence of Jesus. And I said, yes. We've got to declare with our mouth. And just imagine that little crumb. That little tiny bit of spiritual knowledge was transformative, was powerful. That's what happens because there's a hunger there. Japan is hungry for the gospel, for people to get saved. They're just driving hours and hours, the few that know Jesus. And they would stay up all night to, to study their Bible and to know more about the goodness of Jesus Christ. You know, you might be thinking right now today, like, well, what, what can I do? And you're like, because I don't really pray very much. I'm kind of like, Jesus help Japan. Amen. There's like the person next to me and they're like, they cry and they raise their hands. They're like amazing prayers. I don't think I'm so good at praying. Let God show you a miracle with a crumb. Let God do something amazing with just your willingness. You might say, well, I don't have much money, so I don't know if I should give anything to missions. Don't worry about how much it is. Let God do a miracle with a crumb. You know, and we're like, well, I don't know if I can, I can like get behind you or go visit sometime. Maybe I'm not so, so talented. Let God do something amazing with a crumb. Stop Start believing how precious the gospel is. Start believing how amazing, how God has empowered us to do great things. Start believing and declaring that one day, Revelation 7, 9 tells us one day, one day, a great multitude that no one could count from every tribe, tongue, and nation will be standing before the throne, before the Lamb. The Canaanite woman will be there. The 12 apostles will be there. They'll be wearing white robes, and they'll be holding palms, trees in their branches, and they'll cry out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God and Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the nations belong to our God. And Minnesota belongs to our our God and St. James belongs to our God and Osaka Japan belongs to our God and here's my Japanese in an Irish accent the people of Japan will declare suki wa ozai noi suate orariru kamito shayoi okara kimas salvation belongs to our God for Japan is precious to our God brothers and sisters thank you so much for the crumbs that we give, for the become mighty movements of God, for the spirit that moves that we bring to the nations because we know for just a little bit, we know in our own lives what it's like to be starving for God and now to live in the spiritual abundance where we can bless the nations and transform them in Jesus' name.